Hi everyone, today I'm going to take you through the gas exchange section for AQA A-Level Biology. Also, I'll be going through a few exam style questions and their mark schemes. Also, in the comments section, I'll be putting timestamps, so if you want, you can skip to the relevant sections that you wish to study from, if you do not wish to watch the whole video. So let's get started. So, you probably have been introduced to the concept of surface area to volume ratio. Surface area is the size of an organism's surface, and volume is basically the distance from the surface to the centre of the organism. So if we have an amoeba, which is a single-celled organism, this has a large surface area to volume ratio, as it is a thin organism, and it has a large surface area. But if we take, for example, an elephant, this has a small surface area to volume ratio, as the volume inside is very large compared to its surface area. Therefore, we can conclude that the larger an organism is, the smaller the surface area to volume ratio. Now we can link this to gas exchange and diffusion through the concept of Fick's law. Fick's law is the rate of diffusion equals surface area times difference in concentration divided by the length of the diffusion path. Therefore, we can say that the rate of gas exchange or the rate of diffusion is increased with a large surface area and a shorter diffusion path. So now we're going to come on to the adaptations of certain types of organisms to gas exchange. So if we take single-celled organisms, again I'm using the example of an amoeba which is a eukaryotic single-celled organism. These carry out gas exchange across their body surface which is pr a pretty simple concept due to their large surface area to volume ratio. So they don't have any sp special adaptations. So now you're going to need to know about the what we call the tracheal system of insects. So insects don't actually have lungs. They have this thing called a tracheal system, which is made up of tr the trachea here and tracheals. Show these branches. And also they have these things, these little circles here, called spiracles. Let's get my pen. Spiracles are very important as these are the things that insects breathe through, if you like. So this is where the oxygen enters and carbon dioxide diffuses out. You can often see the spiracles if, by looking at an insect as they appear as little holes on the side. So here are some adaptations of insect to gas exchange. So gases enter and exit through spiracles. So oxygen diffuses in and carbon dioxide diffuses out. This gas exchanges through diffusion, as I've said already, so there is a carbon dioxide concentration gradient from the tracheals to the atmosphere, and an oxygen concentration gradient from the atmosphere to the tracheals. They can also do gas exchange via a process called mass transport, which we will get onto in the next video. So this works by the contraction of the abdominal muscles, which moves the gases along so they can be exchanged throughout the body. Also, when in flight, the muscle cells of the insect respire anaerobically to produce lactate. This production of lactate lowers the water potential. So the water moves from the tracheals into the cells to carry out various cellular processes. This means that more air is draw in, drawn in to decrease volume in the tracheals as the water has moved out into the cells. So more air is drawn in so they can respire more efficiently when they are in flight, which is obviously advantageous to their survival. <clears throat> so now you need to know about the gas exchange in fish. You probably already know that fish carry out their gas exchange through gills, which are kind of like flaps on the side of them. So the structure of gills are as follows. So you have these 
what we call gill filaments, which are at right angles to each other, as you can see by the diagram. They are at right angles with, to increase the surface area, so to increase the rate of diffusion of oxygen from the water to the blood. Now, within these gill filaments, we have what we call lamellae. Lamellae are these deep folds within the gills. The deep folds means that, again, we have a very high surface area to increase the rate of diffusion. And the middle of the gill filaments, which is kind of this bit here, is called a gill bar. So here are some adaptations. The lamellae are folded to have a large surface area, increasing the rate of dif diffusion of oxygen from the water to the blood. The lam lamellae and filaments are thin, increasing the diffusion rate as the length of the diffusion path is shorter, so therefore increasing the rate of diffusion as we saw by Fick's law earlier. Also, they use the countercurrent exchange principle to absorb oxygen from the water into the blood. So, what is the countercurrent exchange principle? The countercurrent exchange principle is basically when oxygen in the blood and oxygen, water and blood flow in opposite directions. Now, I'm going to tell you why this is very important. So water and blood flow in opposite directions. So if we have parallel flow, which is when they flow in the same direction, we can see the diffusion gradient of oxygen is maintained here, as there is a higher concentration gradient of water and lower in the blood. So the oxygen moves into the blood quite easily here, and here and here as well, indicated by the arrows. However, as you can see here, the diffusion gradient has stopped as the concentration of oxygen in the water and blood is the same. So therefore, the concentration gradient of oxygen from the water to the blood is not maintained. <clears throat> so less oxygen is absorbed into the blood. Now, if we have countercurrent flow, so as you can see here, the water and the blood are flowing in opposite directions. A favourable concentration gradient of oxygen is maintained all the time. So across the whole length of the lamellae. So we could say the countercurrent flow ensures a favourable concentration gradient of oxygen is maintained across the whole length of the lamellae. So now we need to know about the adaptations of, I'm not even going to try and pronounce this word, but plants basically. So plants exchange gas through pores called stomata, which are these little pores here. Now, you probably recall this from GCSE, but these special cells, called guard cells, control the opening and closing of stomata. So the stomata close at night, open during the day. This helps prevent water loss by evaporation, because if water was lost from the plant, then less photosynthesis would occur. The key term here is evaporation. Also, plants have a, well, the leaves have a small surface area to volume ratio, therefore reducing water loss again by evaporation. They also have a waterproof covering for the same reason. The waterproof covering is what is here, the which is what we call the waxy cuticle. The waxy cuticle is also thick, again, helping prevent water loss. Also, many plants have hairs on their leaves which can trap water vapour and collect them in like pools. This reduces the water potential gradient. This means that less water is again lost by evaporation. Also the cuticle or the leaf can roll to cover the stomata so again the water potential gradient is lowered and less water is lost by evaporation. So now we can get on to gas exchange in humans. So this is probably quite a familiar image to you. This is a pair of human lungs. So here we have the trachea or the windpipe, but at A level you need to say trachea. We have the bronchus or the bronchi, which are the two main stems, that stem are from the trachea that go into both lungs. Then we have the divisions of the bronchi, which are called bronchioles. And we have the diaphragm here, which is the main breathing muscle, and the alveoli, which we will get onto later, which 
is the part of the lungs where oxygen diffuses into the blood. So you need to know about the mechanism of breathing. First, I'm going to talk to you about inspiration or inhalation. So the first step is the lungs have these muscles called external intercostal and internal intercostal muscles. So in inspiration, the external intercostal muscle contracts whilst the internal intercostal muscle relaxes. This means that ribs are pulled upwards and outwards whilst the diaphragm contracts and flattens. So as you can see by the diagram, the diaphragm is contracted so it's flat and is pulled down. This increases the thoracic volume which is the chest cavity. An increased volume means that the air pressure is decreased. This means that air is forced into the lungs down a pressure gradient, so therefore filling the lungs with air. So the next part is expiration or breathing out. So in this process, it's the opposite way round. So the external intercostal muscle relaxes, whilst the internal intercostal muscle contracts. The ribs are pulled downwards and inwards, whilst the diaphragm relaxes and is pushed back into a dome shape. So as you can see by the diagram, the diaphragm has relaxed and is pushed back into a dome shape. This decreases the thoracic volume, therefore increasing the air pressure. So air or carbon dioxide is forced into the atmosphere down the pressure gradient once again. So now we're going to talk about alveoli, which is the part of the lungs where oxygen is absorbed into the blood. So the main adaptation of alveoli is they have a very, very high surface area, as you can see by they are very folded. This means that there is a higher rate of oxygen diffusion into the blood, which means that respiration can be efficient. Also, the alveoli are, as you can see by the diagram, surrounded by a network of capillaries. This means that there is a short diffusion path. Also, the alveolar epithelium, which is the lining of the alveoli, is thin, therefore decreasing the diffusion path. Also, the capillaries are thin, their walls are thin, therefore decreasing the diffusion path again. So oxygen diffuses down a concentration gradient into the blood from the alveolar epithelium and across the ep capillary ep endothelium into the blood. So that is it for the content. Now we're going to get onto some exam style questions. So my highlighter. <clears throat> so let's look at this first question. Scientists studied three species of plant. They selected fully grown leaves from five different plants of each species. For each leaf, they measured leaf surface area, leaf thickness, and the number of stomata per millimeter squared. The scientists' results are shown in the table below. So let's look at the first part of the question. How did the scientists ensure that they could make a valid comparison between leaves from different species? Now I have put that they used fully grown leaves because if the leaves were not fully grown then the surface area and the thickness and the number of stomata would change as the leaf develops and adapts to its environment. So let's look at the mark scheme so we can look at possible answers that you could put. So the scientists use fully grown leaves, which means we will get the mark. Or you could put, they use five plants of each species to make the results more reliable. So you could put either one of these, it doesn't matter which one you put, you'll still get the mark. But here it says, ignore all the references to methodology. So you don't get the mark if you write anything else. So reward only information provided in the resource. So if you write something that's not relevant to the information in the question, you don't get the mark. Also, it says here, do not accept reference to the number of leaves different plants are used. So if you put this, you do not get the mark. Here's the next question. Describe a method you could use to find the surface area of a leaf. Now, this doesn't really require knowledge from the specification. It requires your own ideas, even though it is a describe question. So you don't need to explain what you're doing. You just need to put what you are doing. So here's what I've suggested. 
They draw around the leaf on some graph paper, as graph paper has squares. This means that you can count the squares. Then what you do is you need to multiply by 2 as the leaf has an upper surface and a lower surface. This is kind of similar to some maths work that you might have done lower down in your education. So let's look at the mark scheme. Either draw around the leaf on graph paper. Now here it says mark as a trio, mark point 1, mark point 2 and mark point 3 or mark point 4, mark point 5 and mark point 6. Do not mix and match. So you need to write these three points together or these three points together. You can't write, for example, mark point 1, mark point 4 and mark point 2 together. Otherwise, you do not get the mark, any marks. Also, it says both aspects needed for the mark, drawing and type of paper. So you need both. So you can't just put draw around the leaf as the examiner might think you mean draw it around it on plain paper. If you drew, drew around it on plain paper, this means you couldn't really count the area as plain paper doesn't have any squares. The next marking point, count the squares however described, we'll get that mark. And it says here there is no reward for additional detail, e.g. dealing with part squares. This is important as it doesn't say explain in the question, so there's no need to put any more detail. And the third marking point here is multiply by two for upper and lower leaf surface. Now here is the other set of marks that you could have put. Draw around the leaf on paper of known mass per unit area, so both aspects are needed. Cut out and weigh and then multiply by two. Now I think it's easier to put this well, you can put this if you want. So this is the next part of the question. Which species, A or B, would you predict grew in a drier environment? Explain one feature that caused you to choose this species. So I have put species B. Because as you can see, there is less stomata than species A. Less stomata means that there are less openings, so less water is lost by evaporation. So let's look at the mark scheme. So species B, you don't get any mark if you put for the species. You only get the mark for the explanation. So you can either put smaller surface area, so less evaporation or less heat absorbed. Or you can put thicker leaves, so greater diffusion distance, so less water is lost. Or you can put, which I have put, fewer stomata or lower stomatal density, so less diffusion or evaporation of water. Or you can put smaller surface area to volume ratio, so less evaporation. So let's look at the next question. Other than the features of leaves in the table, give two features of leaves of xerophytes. For each feature, explain how it reduces water loss. Now a xerophyte, if you don't already know, is a plant that lives on land or in dry environments. So you just need to write and explain a point that I made in my adaptations that plants have earlier in the video. So the first thing is rolling or the curling of leaves or the cuticle, which decreases the water potential gradient, as I mentioned. And also hair on leaves, which again decreases water potential gradient. So you can put any four of these, but you can only put a maximum of two. You don't get say four marks if you wrote all four. So you can put thicker cuticle so increase in diffusion distance. Now it says here feature and explanation is needed for each mark. So if you just put the feature or just put the explanation then you don't get the marks. To reject other features not related to leaves. So if you put something that's not related to a leaf you don't get any marks as it says reject no matter what else you put. Reject features related to water storage, so for the vacuole, and the cuticle alone is insufficient, so you need to put thicker. And it also says reject suggestion of less diffusion. So the second point you could have put, hairs on leaves, so reduction in air movement slash increase in humidity slash decrease in water potential gradient, which we put. Also, curled leaves or rolled leaves, so reduction in air movement slash increase in humidity slash decrease in water potential gradient, which we put also, so we would get two marks. Or you could put that the plants have sunken stomata, 
which is the same explanation as before. So let's look at the final part of the question, I think. Species C has a high number of stomata per millimetre squared. Despite this, it loses a small amount of water. Use the table to explain why. As you can see, species C has a lower surface area, a much lower surface area than the others. Less surface area means that it has a lower total number of stomata. Now you're probably confused at this. Now in the table it says a mean number of stomata per millimetre squared, which is obviously going to be different from the total number of stomata. So a low surface area obviously means that there'll be less stomata, as less stomata can fit into a lower surface area. So if we look at the mark scheme, small leaves have surface area, so total number of stomata is low. So we would get that mark. So both aspects are needed for the mark. So you can't just put small leaves or small surface area. You need to write the explanation as well to get the mark. So let's look at the next question. Describe how oxygen in the air reaches capillaries surrounding alveoli in the lungs. Details of breathing are not required. So as this is a describe question, you don't need to explain why something is happening. You just need to write what is happening. Now that said, details of breathing are not required. You don't need to write anything about certain muscles relaxing or contracting or whatever. Here's what I've put. So air travels through the trachea, bronchi, bronchioles and reaches the alveoli down a pressure gradient. The examiner likes when you use the terms to do with gradients. Then oxygen travels down a diffusion gradient through the alveolar epithelium, as I mentioned earlier. So let's look at the mark scheme. Trachea and bronchi and bronchioles, get that mark, down the pressure gradient, and we mentioned down the diffusion gradient as well, and across the alveolar epithelium. Capillary wall is neutral because it likes you to put endothelium or epithelium. And as it says four marks, you don't get an extra mark if you wrote all five points. You can only get a maximum of four. So let's look at the next question here which is a math related question, which is everyone's favourite. So forced expiratory volume is the greatest volume of air a person can breathe out in one second. Forced vital, vital capacity is the greatest volume of air a person can breathe out in a single breath. The figure below shows results for the volume of air breathed out by three groups of people, A, B and C. Group A had healthy lungs. Groups B and C had different lung conditions that affect breathing. So here we have our graph here. Calculate the percentage drop in FEV for group C compared with the healthy people. Now the first step that we need to do here, we need to calculate the FEV for group C and the healthy people. So group C I have calculated to be 0.8. I know it's 0.8 because FEV, as it says in the question, is the greatest volume of air a person can breathe out in one second. So on the x-axis here, we need to look at the one second point. And if we follow up here, group C is at this point, which is 0.8. And now we need to look at group A, which is the healthy people. So if we follow up and along, we can see that group A, FEV, is 4.2. Now to calculate the percentage drop, we need to take away these points from each other. So 4.2 minus 0.8 is 3.4. Now you need to figure out 3.4 as a percentage of 4.2. So to do that, we divide 3.4 by 4.2 and divide and times by 100 to get the percentage. So I've got 80.9. So therefore we can conclude our answer is 80.9%. Now, the funny thing is with these maths questions in biology is that they often require a lot of working out even though it is one mark. But I would recommend writing your working out so the examiner can see where your answer is coming from. So here's the mark scheme which is a bit vague, so it says about 80% and our answer was 80.9%, so we would get that mark. So this is the final question of the video. So let's read it. Asthma affects bronchioles and reduces airflow in and out of the lungs. 
Fibrosis does not affect bronchioles. It reduces the volume of the lungs. Which group, B or C, was the one containing people with fibrosis of their lungs? Use the information provided and evidence from the figure above to explain your answer. So this is what I've put. I've said that it is group B because they have a similar FEV to group A. As you can see by the graph. This concludes that the bronchioles aren't affected. But as you can see in group B, the FVC is reduced as the maximum volume of air is lower than group A, much lower, as you can see by the graph. So let's look at the mark scheme. Group B, because they breathe out as quickly as, as healthy group or have similar FEV to group A, as the volume breathed out in one second is similar to group A. This means that the bronchioles are not affected, because as you can see by the question, Bronchioles are affected when airflow is reduced in and out of the lungs. The third marking point here is that FVC is reduced or the total volume breathe out is, is reduced. So we put all three of those marks and we will get three marks for that question. Now it says here allow this marking point for group C. So that is it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please comment them below and I'll see you in the next video.